I did spend a lot of time thinking about the music and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just putting in my favorite songs from an era. I wanted to make sure that I was choosing based on the characters and what they might have been listening to. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. We make e-readers and apps, we sell ebooks and audiobooks, and we do it all because we want to help everyone spend more time reading. One of the best parts of the work that we do is that we get to talk with authors about their books as well as the books that shape them as writers and as readers. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Emily Schultz, author of several novels including The Blondes, a pandemic thriller that everyone should read, even if they're not kept indoors by an actual pandemic, and the new novel Little Threats. Little Threats is in a sense, a whodunit, but it's also a reflection on the ripple effects of privilege, crime, and punishment. Emily Schultz, welcome to Kobo. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Little Threats is by no means your first work of fiction. You first wrote Joyland and published it with the small but mighty ECW Press. Then there was the title Heaven is Small with the slightly larger but still very independent House of Anansi Press, The Blondes you did with St. Martin's, and now Little Threats with Putnam. That's four different publishers, four very different kinds of editors and editorial experience. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to span that spectrum of publishers going from uh, small to big? You know, I don't know if you really notice it. It's sort of like, you know, it's kind of like asking, what is it like to watch a child grow up? You know what I mean? At the time in my life when I was doing very small press, and I even did micro press and like little anonymous chat books and things like that, it just felt right for where I was. And, you know, every single book you put out is so exciting when you're releasing it. And, and it's all about that project. And then, you know, it's just, you know, you kind of grow as an author and, and develop and, you know, I've, I've been really lucky, I think, to work with so many great editors and publicists. I mean, everybody that I've worked with has just been fantastic over the years. I've had a lot of support for my work, and I feel really grateful for that. You are also a part of the Kobo origin story. Did you know this? Uh, no, I need to hear this. Okay. So at the very, very beginning of Kobo's history, we actually had a different name. We were called Short Covers. And the very first publisher that we called up to try and do a digital promotion with was House of Anansi Press. And so I think... This does sound familiar to me, yes. Yeah. So within about a month of Kobo being born, I think back in, uh, we're talking about like probably 2009, we did our first digital promotion, giving away free digital copies of Heaven is Small. I think that it helped that book get an audience for sure. I remember being very excited to watch my book rising on your website and seeing it next to some of the real heavy hitters. And as like, you know, I think I, that was my second novel as, you know, second time novelist just being over the moon. Little Threats is a story of murder, of families, privilege and its limits, who we can and can't trust. I'd love to have you give a, just a little bit of an introduction to people of this book. And let's try it this way. If you were to pick two characters to describe who encapsulate little threats for you, who would you choose? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> well, the book is about twin sisters, Kennedy and Carter Wynn. And one of them, Kennedy, has gone away to prison for a murder that she can't remember whether she committed it or not because she has memory gaps due to drug use. And Carter is the twin that's been out in the world, you know, for the last 15 years. And if I were casting them, so to speak, you know, I would imagine Kristen Stewart playing Kennedy because she's tough and, you know, she's been quite hardened by her experiences. But then... The identical twin sister obviously would also have to be played by Kristen Stewart, but she's so much softer and she's a character who she's trying to come to terms with her sister and whether or not she was guilty and what it means for her to come back into the world and come back into her life. And so I feel like even though they're identical twins, if you imagine her in your mind, you might imagine someone softer like, like Amanda Seyfried or somebody like that playing her character. Got it. The book opens up with a line that I found both 
so haunting and also in some ways kind of heartbreaking, which is there is always a living boy to go with a dead girl. Can you unpack that a bit for me? Well, you know, the reason that this this novel went off in a crime direction is because I was watching a lot of true crime shows. I think a lot of people were starting to listen more to, to true crime podcasts like Serial. And the thing always that devastates me, and true crime books as well, like, you know, Michelle McNamara's I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And the thing that I think is so devastating about all of these horrific and violent crimes is that they are largely committed against girls and women by men. And so I wanted to look a little bit in this book at the victim. I wanted to look at her as a person. I wanted to look at how her death affected all the people around her. So that's why her family members are part of the book, um, even though it's years later. And also how it affected the wins, you know, the two girls, the twins in the novel as well, because they may or may not have been guilty, but they also lost a friend. And that was something I really wanted to look at is just uh, these dynamics that happen in a crime and how crime is often you know, there's a sociology to it that sometimes we forget to, to look at when we're reading for fun. As you say, so many different kinds of media start out with the young corpse, whether we're looking at true crime television, whether we're looking at true crime podcasts, CSI, there's always a corpse alone at the beginning. How much did you have all of that in your head as you were starting a book like this, knowing that all of those images are already hanging out there for people? Well, things come in pieces when you're writing. Um, So I didn't start with that section. I think I I was, you know, a good way into the first draft before I decided to put in that particular opening. The opening is, uh, it's a creative writing assignment that Kennedy has done from prison. And I wanted to do that because one of the things I really wanted to capture that would be a consistency between my books was that first person, very intimate point of view. In The Blondes, Hazel is a first person story. She's our character and she leads us through a a ridiculous virus and pandemic. And then in this novel, even though most of the novel is in the third person and it skips between characters, I wanted to have a really intimate view of Kennedy. I felt like, you know, there are lots of characters in the book, but she's our lead. And so... That little section came in later, and I added a bunch of the creative writing assignments in later. I don't always know everything when I start out. I don't always know where I'm going, and I just follow it. So you aren't the person who has a giant chart up on the wall that has every character, every arc, every theme all uh, blown out and ready to go. I eventually have all of that, but after I've done oh, well done <laughs> most of a first draft, or even all of a first draft. Yeah. So like, I mean, I actually put up all the character names on cue cards and had them color-coded, and put them all on my wall in the order that their chapters or scenes appear so that I could see if the characters had enough balance in terms of who was I giving preference to and who did I need to show more of and things like that. So I will do that kind of work, but not on first draft. So as a total sidebar, somewhere out there on the internet, there needs to be a gallery of the note-taking setups of authors, of the charts and the post-its and the cue cards, because I can't imagine a more interesting way to see inside an author's mind than how they're trying to organize all of this in their head. Someone has to do that. That would be wonderful. I have a photo and I maybe I need to like, you know, post it somewhere and somebody needs to take your idea and do it for a whole bunch of novelists. I know the West Coast Canadian writer Timothy Taylor at one point sent me some visuals for a class I was teaching and he, and he has great like sort of story maps for his own work as well. There are two elements I want to pick up on. One is that notion of writing as a way of making sense of the world, which is something that, that, as you say, Kennedy begins in prison. And one of the elements that struck me in the book was that, as you say, Kennedy's introduced to writing as a, a part of a program while she's in prison. And the writing that she's doing is, on one hand, illuminating the experiences that she's had, but there is also this sense of detachment of being an observer to her life. Is that something that you can speak to a bit? If I I meant for there to be that detachment, I think that it, it has to do with the fact that she's been away from society for so long and the fact that she's, you know, become a guarded person. Mm-hmm. In some ways, what I wanted to show is, is what it means to uh, go from girlhood to almost like an instant womanhood with Kennedy. She has to cope with the fact that the crime takes place in 1993, 
And then it's 2008 when we join the story and she's getting out of prison. I wanted to show the difference between those years and those decades. You know, we go from the Nirvana years and the death of Kurt Cobain, and then we jump ahead to, you know, the election of President Obama and just how much changes in the course of 15 years. And so with Kennedy, I think I was, not that I was holding her back, but that her character is maybe stilted in some way that the other characters are not. Well, and maybe that's what I was picking up on was that sense of, holding back, of trying to capture the world, but not feeling comfortable really putting yourself in it. So in the other piece, though, is that notion of prison. And Kennedy has vanished decades. She's put through the court system, through the trial system. She spends time in prison. She comes out the other side. Did you have to do a fairly deep dive into issues of crime and punishment to try and capture some of that? I did a little Mostly, I mean, I have family members who work in the prison system. I have an aunt who taught literacy in uh, Virginia prisons for 30 years, and I have a brother who's a CO. So I did know some things about prison life and the justice system. Writing the uh, the plea scenes where she actually um, takes her plea deal, that was a little harder, and I did some research online for that. There are decades that come through in this book very strongly. You have the 90s of grunge that are you know, in some ways like even portrayed through the mixtapes that are left lying around in Kennedy's room full of Nirvana and <laughs> Husker Du and uh, Echo and the Bunnymen. I know that's 80s, not 90s, but still. And then this vivid leap forward into 2008 with the events surrounding the election of Obama, financial crisis and everything else. But even Echo's going back into... Kennedy's parents' lives of like 1980s money and upward mobility, kind of how you wanted to evoke different decades. And were you trying to land sort of particular feelings and particular themes for different periods in time? Oh, wow. That's so fascinating. I mean, I did spend a lot of time thinking about the music and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just putting in my favorite songs from an era. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was choosing based on the characters and what they might have been listening to. You know, in this case, you know, Kennedy is a little more goth, you know, someplace in between goth and grunge, perhaps. And so that meant that I left out a lot of other kinds of music that were really popular at that time. You know, instead it went Lollapalooza, but it could have easily, you know, there were a lot of people who were, you know, rap was huge in the 80s, late 80s and into the 90s. But I was, you're right, I was looking at that sort of curve between the late 80s and the early 90s. 1993 for me is a particularly memorable year. I'm a couple years older than my characters, and that was the year that I moved out and had my first apartment at 19. So I remember a lot from that year, and I, I was just going on my memories. But the, the late 80s, I think, you know, definitely inform it. Like I was thinking about the 80s are so much about money and status when we look back at them, and style too. But also the idea of the McMansion, which is where I've placed the Wynn family, you know, the sisters grow up in this fictional suburb. And I wanted to, to show that I feel like the McMansion was really on the rise at that time, you know, where people were investing in these giant sort of cookie cutter houses. And, you know, it, it shows a lot about their parents, but it also shows something about them in terms of what the expectation is on them. I wanted to look at um, what parents want for their kids at a certain age and the sort of pressures that can be put on them. But particularly, I think, at that time period where there's this switch that happens between the 80s and the 90s where it's like, you know, you have the preppy and then you slide into grunge, as you're saying. And grunge was about, you know, not following the rules. Whereas in the 80s, I think it was very much about following the rules to some extent and trying to achieve and being high achieving. And so that was one of the things that I wanted to look at, um, particularly for their father, Jerry Wynn, but also, you know, the girls' names, Carter and Kennedy, come out of this idea of a, just a desire for the idea that his daughters could go on to become presidents or something like that. So I did want to look at the, the 90s and how it became this transgressive time and a reaction sort of kicking against just the previous years right before that. There was almost a feeling as I was reading this, it was like, yeah, this is like John Hughes through a lens darkly that you have on one side, all of the, the comforts and the security that money can provide, 
but then how that can tip over into this you know, this very different kind of darkness. And especially where money and privilege and the justice system intersect. So you do a very vivid portrayal of how justice is different when there's money in the mix. Sure. I mean, this is just it. Rich kids are not supposed to go to jail. And that's the idea here is that somehow she does wind up going to prison. And the reason is because the other suspects are all richer than she is and they have more privilege than she does. So although she's extremely privileged, there's always someone with more lawyers. And I wanted to look at that. She's kind of a strange character to follow in that, you know, I'm, I'm setting up a situation that doesn't happen, I don't think, very often. But I liked also the idea of following a girl character through an experience like that since we would normally think of, of male criminals. And so that was something else I wanted to look at. But I mean, I think there is a difference here for me in that I certainly didn't grow up in a wealthy suburb. I grew up, as I was telling you before we started the podcast, in you know like a small, very small working class town in Ontario. So for me to try to get into the mindsets of these characters, I did have to put some of myself aside and try to see what they would see in their world, which is completely different than mine. I mean, in some ways, I'm more like Everett, who's the brother to the girl who dies. And he, you know, lives close to their neighborhood, but he's much more working class and has a lot less than they do. Let's go back into your childhood a bit and talk about how your relationship to reading and writing began. What were the books that first captured you when you were young? <laughs> you know, I think very typical children's novels, you know, like Charlotte's Web and that sort of thing. And I remember reading all of Lucy Maud Montgomery, Emily of New Moon, and Anne of Green Gables, and all of the books in those series. And I used to read them with my mother. She used to read aloud to me much longer, really, than you normally would read to a child, but just because we both enjoyed that relationship. I can remember when I was in sixth grade, my aunt, who was an English teacher, my father was also an English teacher. But my aunt brought me some signed copies of young adult books that she had gotten at a conference. And I just remember being absolutely thrilled to have these autographed books. And I think that really started my obsession. Um, you know, the idea that there were real authors behind the books was fascinating to me. And there was a man named Richard Peck. Uh, he was a young adult author in the Midwest. And I wrote to him for several years, actually. And he would write back to me, which was really sweet. Oh, wow. Yeah. When I think back on it, you know, I've never met him as an adult and I really regret it because he wrote up until he was about 80 and uh, or maybe even longer. And he died just a couple of years ago. So I'm, I really am mad at myself that I never reached out again once I became an author. And was that part of the kind of the tipping point for you between being a reader and thinking about being a writer? I think I always knew that I wanted to be a writer. My father wrote poems that he didn't show to anyone and had them in notebooks. And he was a high school English teacher. And my mother always said that he should be a writer. They had met. Uh, my mother was actually judging a literary contest when they were in college. She was one year older than him. So she was doing her master's, I believe. And he was probably finishing his BA. And she awarded his story. And that was how they met and started dating. Oh, good relationship <laughs> origin story. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So, I mean, I think, you know, from a young age, like I was surrounded by people who loved books. And so it just made sense to me. I think I always knew I wanted to be an author. But at that turning point, I think when you're, you know, entering your teen years and you look at what you want to do with your life, that was when I started to get serious and started to read more adult books as well. Like I read a lot of poetry. I remember you know, reading Margaret Atwood's poetry and also reading the beats, which are mentioned in Little Threats. You know, it's an interesting arc, I think, when you go from young adult fiction into like darker content. <laughs> and so around the time that you were starting on your first book, Joyland, what was on your bookshelf then? Who were the authors that you were digging into as you were trying to get your head around putting together your first novel? the difficult ones. And I don't know, I think that's something that writers do when they're young is they really, really challenge themselves and they, they always go to the most difficult writers. And maybe I should have chosen simpler writers. Maybe it wouldn't have taken me as long to hammer out a decent plot because I had a tendency to, to work on the sentencing and do a lot of things with theme and, and just trying to find the poetry of a line. Um, I was reading things like Jonathan Lethem, uh, Fortress of Solitude, and I was re reading Michael Chabon, 
and I was reading, oh, one of the authors actually that I felt really influenced the blondes, which is skipping ahead a little bit, but was Jill Adamson. Because with The Outlander, I felt like she had created almost like an action novel for women, even though it's both Western and historical. What I saw in that was Mm -hmm. kind of like an action novel for women. And that really inspired me, actually, when I started working on The Blondes. Let's talk about The Blondes a bit, because it's both fascinating as a book, and then you've done other things with it around the book. Is The Blondes that ended up as the final product, The Blondes that you thought you were going to write when you first started it? it's pretty close to what I wanted to write. I mean, it it was a hard book to nail the tone because it's got horror in it and it's also got kind of a political satire. You know, people have called it spec lit. People have called it a literary thriller. It's, It's been categorized any number of ways. But I think I always knew that it was going to be both funny and violent and also a portrayal of what happens when society is falling apart. I wrote that book very fast, though, and then I did do a lot of revision on it, which is kind of my tendency is to write something in a matter of weeks and then go back and revise it for several years. It's worth it for people that don't know. Give us a couple of sentences of summary about the plot of The Blondes, because it's a fascinating premise. So the idea behind The Blondes is it's a rabies-like virus that affects only blonde women and makes them rage out. And what happens is our protagonist, Hazel Hayes, is in New York. She's from uh, Toronto. And she gets stuck here during a pandemic. And I'm really, I got to be honest with you, I'm feeling it right now. Uh, When they announced during COVID that they were closing the Canadian border, I felt like Hazel. I I really was like, should I throw everything I have in a car and drive for the border tonight now? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) But it's about the breakdown of things like um, human rights. And again, it is a little bit about privilege and how we see each other and how we stereotype one another. There's a lot about power in that book as well. Would you consider these books that are just outgrowths of your own, of themes that you're generally trying to explore? Would you classify you know, both The Blondes and Little Threats as books that exist uniquely in a post-Me Too era? The Blondes certainly does not. I mean, The Blondes, I, if I were to update it, I would I would definitely change the relationships and, you know, bump some things up in that book and bump other things down in that book. Mm-hmm. But because it released in three different countries, it released in Canada, it released in translation in France, and it released in the US. And so that book came out over over a period of years, most of which were before Me Too. Got it. With Little Threats, it is very much, I think, inspired by that movement. I really did the hard work on this book uh, starting in the fall of 2017 at that moment. And um, for me, it became a very personal book. Actually, I would say it's more personal than some of my others. I would say The Blondes is kind of conceptual and funny in some ways. Whereas this one, I think maybe that's where that darkness that you're feeling is coming from, is instead of dealing with some of the real threats in my life, I was going into these characters and exploring power dynamics through them, the idea of relationships with young girls and much older men. It was easier for me to look at that, you know, and go back into even some of the relationships I had at 16 than to look at some of the things that have occurred to me as an adult woman. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because it is quite central to both the plot of Little Threats and, as you say, the power dynamics that stretch through it of those early relationships where, you know, you feel like you're an adult and you've feel like you're making, you know, the right decisions for you. And when you look back at them in time, you kind of, you know, clutch your head with (laughs) terror about the situations you were putting yourself in. Yeah, sure. You know what I was thinking about this morning, actually, is how many rides I took with people when I was a teenager without even thinking about it, just because you need a ride and someone offers you a ride. And that's one of the things that comes in in this novel. And I don't know if that had to do with the time period or not. The fact that we didn't have, we didn't have Uber or Lyft. And so you, you wind up often in situations when you're a young girl who doesn't drive yet, or who barely drives, where you're getting rides from men. And that's definitely a theme in this book, as well as it was interesting that you brought up John Hughes earlier, because I think that I described Burke Butler, who's the older college boyfriend to these girls. And I describe him as kind of like a John Hughes character, I think at one point, that boyfriend, that older boyfriend that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he has that sort of glossy veneer the older boyfriends in John Hughes movies have. 
Yeah. Which there's a heartbreaking element to this is like, you know, really, do we just need better public transportation? Like, could we just <laughs> like, let's just not get into strange people's cars because we can't get a ride. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is one of those things where I've been thinking about this is I think also these relationships where um, if someone was only a handful of years older than you, it was considered acceptable. I think especially if you were a girl of 16 or 17, the idea that you might be dating someone who was in their early 20s was completely acceptable. We saw it in movies all the time. Mm -hmm. And now we don't find it acceptable. I mean, even at that time, the idea that a 40 year old man might flirt with the babysitter, you know, that was almost like a trope, you know, in television and in films. And so I think we just didn't have the same, it's not that we didn't have the same understanding around it. I think everyone knows that's wrong, but we didn't have the same language around it to say that there's a power dynamic here. And this is, you know, whether it's consensual or not, you know, it's, it's not necessarily healthy. Well, and it's funny how it takes time to, as you say, move from the feeling of this probably isn't right to building enough discourse around it and enough language around it that it becomes easier to look at something and go, yeah, that's, you know, not only is it not right, we have ways of describing how it's not, it's not right. Yeah. Going back to the blondes for just a second, because I wanted to pick up on one particular idea. The blondes also has been turned into a podcast. Yes. And I did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. So what happened with the blondes is it was optioned by AMC Shutter, and it spent a couple of years with them and it wasn't moving forward. And so when the rights reverted back to me, my partner, Brian, and I were working partners and life partners. So Brian Davis and I decided, let's make it into a podcast. I mean, if we're going to write a treatment or a script for this, let's make it into something that we can afford to make as opposed to a film or television series, which we certainly cannot afford to make. And so we basically adapted it ourselves and wrote the script for it. And then it became a podcast with actors, uh, Madeline Zima and Rob Belushi and Helen Hong and a whole cast of actors here in New York as well, theater actors. So we went out to LA and recorded there and we recorded here in New York, largely in my room here with this mic and <laughs> what you see before you, which of course no one else can see. But anyway, it's, um, it became a podcast. We hired uh, Toronto musicians to do the music for that. A very close friend of mine, Don Lewis and Joseph Davis, who goes by the name Old Father. And basically, I mean, it helped that Brian has worked in audio production. He worked for the Blocks Recording Club years ago. And so we basically just took all of that indie experience that we had anyway and said, let's make a thing. So has that made you think differently about your work as an author and the things that you do around a book? Or was this a one-time special experiment? Oh, no, actually, we're making another podcast now that's, um, although it's not from a, from a novel, it's, a, it's an original script. But I've always been a real film fan. And so I think that that affects my writing as well, is I'm always trying to see a scene visually and trying to make it active in terms of what the characters are doing and what they're saying to each other and how they're interacting. I have a big DVD and Blu-ray collection and I'm a bit of a film nerd. And I think it has played into my writing somewhat. When you went through the process of making The Blondes as a podcast, is it a faithful reproduction of the book or were there things that you changed and adapted as you were putting it into an audio form? I, it's definitely different. I wanted to do a sequel to The Blondes and I had started to write that. And so some of the material that I had started to get down for another book, you know, in the same universe, went into the podcast as well. It was almost like... Um, yeah, I mean, it's almost like a sequel to The Blondes. It covers about the first half of the novel, and then it diverges from there. So we brought in new, a few new characters and kept some of the same old characters. And it's, it's, it's different. But I mean, every adaptation is different. You know, whether it's for television or film, it's never going to be the same exactly as the book. Because a book works in its own way. You get usually very deep into a character's head, and that's one of the experiences that readers love. But in a film, you've only got two hours, so you don't get as deep into their head. You have to watch them, you know, doing something, performing. And in this case, with, a, like, I mean, it's kind of like a radio adaptation. Um, we realized that there were certain elements that wouldn't come through 
because we didn't have visuals. So we had to figure out a storytelling way. So, I mean, we decided to make some fake documentaries and sort of fake recordings for the character of Hazel that we could patch together uh, to construct something that would make sense to the, to the listener. I was going to say reader, but listener. <laughs> right. We're quite ecumenical. We would believe that listening to something about a book is also reading. So you're in good hands. Are you looking at doing anything on an audio basis related to Little Threats? It's funny. I haven't thought about it yet. The book feels still so new to me. I mean, because it just came out and I, I haven't even thought about that. I've thought about, you know, what would it look like if it were on screen or who might be suited to these characters? You know, like I like to imagine somebody like Octavia Spencer for the detective Dean Ash, who's like trying to get a crime show made about this old case. But I haven't thought about actually doing the adaptation work myself or, or translating it to an audio form yet. Not yet, but maybe maybe I'll start now that you've asked me that. <laughs> well, I guess the reason I was asking was, as you start to express yourself in multiple media, I was kind of wondering if in the writing process itself, you start to think about, okay, this is working well on the page, but I would want to do it differently if I was doing it in a spoken word context, or if when you're writing the book, you're in the book, you're thinking about it as words on the page and how a kind of a traditional reader will express it. I think if I were a smarter writer, I would be thinking about all that. But like, I'm trying to write a new novel now, and I'm honestly just thinking about it as a novel. I'm just putting the characters in the room and trying to figure out what I can reveal about each one and how I can express their conflicts. And I haven't gotten to that stage yet where I can think on all those different levels. I would like to be able to achieve that because I could probably make a novel that's far more adaptable. Although sometimes you have to make a novel just for the sake of the novel. And let's be clear, making a novel is hard enough. Thank you very much. Like, <laughs> this, you shouldn't have to do that and do it on a unicycle at the same time or while juggling. <laughs> so I think that's fine. Yeah, it's a weird trick. I'm glad you went towards tricks because, I mean, the novel, making a novel really is like performing a trick. In your transition from The Blondes then to Little Threats, did you reach to different authors or to other storytellers as you were getting into this idea of telling you know, a story that had a crime element, you know, a, a justice and punishment element to it as well? Well, as I said, I, I've always been interested in true crime. So there are certain cases that fascinate me. Honestly, they're far too dark, really, to talk about. Sometimes I get very just enmeshed in, in this, and I start doing inter internet research into terrible crime cases. The ones I guess that fascinate me are often uh, about girls or women. The ones that are committed by girls and women are really interesting. Um, so I was more reading that type of material and watching, you know, like investigation discovery and that sort of thing, more so than looking at other mystery novels or suspense novels. Although I do read a lot of mystery and suspense novels for my work because I also, I moonlight as an editor. So I edit any number of other types of novels. And I think probably all of it has some kind of influence and just creeps its way into my psyche. One thing that caught me as I was reading Little Threats was that it is also maybe possibly a ghost story. And I was wondering whether that felt like a risky thing to introduce in something that's very much about, you know, families and, you know, and murders and power and punishment. It's interesting that you picked up on that, because I think that's actually one of the things that joins this book to my other books. Heaven is Small is about a man who's already dead and gone to heaven when we join him, even though heaven is a very strange place and nothing like we imagined. And in The Blondes, I think there is, you know, kind of just not really a supernatural element, but certainly there could never be a hair virus. Although never say never, because... Yeah, don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that the ghost in this novel is, it, it kind of, to me, joins these three in some kind of fantastical universe. I was worried about doing it, though. I didn't know how people would react. And some people really seem to like it and other people don't. One of the reasons I wanted to have it in is I felt that, you know, this is a character who we meet in flashback. Uh, her name's Haley Kimberson. We meet her as the dead girl. And I, I wanted to give her some kind of embodiment and also show that she has still an influence on, you know, the people in the, in the living world. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, I wanted it to show how each character is reacting to her, reacting to their own involvement in the crime or their own guilt. 
And I thought it was just a way to do that, to show her as more fleshed out, strangely, is, you know, what I'm going to say about that. I liked it because one of the themes that came up for me through this book was you know, that idea of voice, of people losing their voices, of having their voices taken away, of finding them in new ways, of causing them to be lost. And it kept her from being the traditional corpse at the beginning of the story and turned her into something more interesting. So I appreciated that. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. You said you're working on something new. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I'm working on something new. It hasn't gone as quickly as I wanted it to, in part because of the pandemic. I find it, and I'm sure a lot of people are finding it very difficult to concentrate right now on their work, uh, especially when many of us are homeschooling children, et cetera, et cetera. But it's about a woman who's had an accident, or maybe it isn't an accident, and she has been in a 14-day coma. And her friends decide to hold a party for her when she gets out of the hospital. And their idea is that they're going to help her remember. They're going to help her remember her life and herself and what happened because she's lost a lot of that. One last question. We're having this interview in the midst of the pandemic. How has your reading life changed while we've been locked up and in quarantine? Sadly, I'm not doing as much reading for pleasure as I would like. I feel like I've been doing a lot more reading professionally this is one of the things about working as an editor is it's hard to switch between the two in terms of going from reading all day, but it's work and then reading at night, but it's not work. So I do still have a tendency to, to really go towards forms that are shorter, like uh, poetry and short stories. And one of the books that I really liked is by a woman named Rebecca Fishow. And I first met her because I published her on Joyland, which was the magazine that I ran for many years. And it's continuing, but without me. And her new collection of short stories is called The Trouble with Language. And I just felt like her work is so honed and the images are so fresh. And so that, that's one that I've read recently. And I'm going to do an event with her in January, I think, online. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. It does remind me, though, of, of a story that I have to ask you about, which is you have Joyland the book, we have Joyland the magazine, and then we have Joyland the mix-up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about Joyland the mix-up? Yeah. So Joyland the novel came out with ECW, and it had, um, it had drawings in it by Nate Powell, who's now gone on to become quite an acclaimed graphic novelist. He did the uh, the graphic novels March and the mix up. I mean, so that book came out, uh, Michael Holmes was the editor and it was a really great experience for me as a first novel. Uh, it's about classic video games and um, you know, like Pac-Man and space invaders and joust and Tetris. And uh, it came out in 2006, I think. And then Stephen King released a different novel named Joyland and his was about uh, an abandoned amusement park which there are a bunch, there were a bunch, I think, here in the U.S. called Joyland. And so it made sense that he chose that title. But when he chose that title, he released his book only in print. And my book was in print and ebook. And so a bunch of people bought my ebook thinking they were getting Stephen King. And that was really kind of exciting because I started getting royalties that I think were probably meant for Stephen King. But then I also picked up new readers from that. And uh, so I, I managed to cultivate a new audience. And also I kept track of all the money I spent from that royalty check that came like eight years later. You know, you don't expect to get royalties on a book, you know, suddenly get a large chunk of money eight years later. So I kept track of everything I spent it on and started a blog called Spending the Stephen King Money. And he, he became aware of it and he was really gracious about it. It was really quite nice. And I have to say, I thought the things you invested Stephen King's money in were excellent uses of royalties. So I could not have spent it better myself. Thank you. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Michael. I have been speaking with Emily Schultz. Her new book is Little Threats. It and the other books we've talked about here, along with previous episodes of the show, can be found at kobo.com slash conversation. Or you can check the show notes. Make sure to catch every conversation by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen and leave us a review. It helps other readers to find us. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj, edited by Kelly Robotham, and hosted by me, Michael Tamblin. Thank you for listening. <laughs>